Welcome to this episode of the Revolution and Ideology podcast. Uh, we're continuing our Myth is America series. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. This is the beginning of a huge undertaking. We're going to be discussing the American War for Independence. Um, so we're going to try to touch on the things that we think are important. I'm only mentioning that because if Jared and I get talking about this point in American history, we can go on uh, literally forever, mostly because it is such a crucial part in the formation of the origin story of this country. And so much of it is just pure myth, which is the whole point of this series uh, in the podcast. So we're starting this not knowing how many episodes this is going to turn into or how long those episodes will be. So hopefully you're enjoying it as we go along and we'll see uh, what happens on the other side. But Jared's going to go ahead and kick us off. Yeah, and keep in mind, we already kind of, in the in the immediately prior episode regarding like the, the French and Indian War and the taxation, or at least the first two uh, acts, the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act, we've already kind of started to guide us towards this war for independence, kind of building this momentum uh, towards what's going to happen. And we have to keep in mind, at first, before we really dig into to any of these other, like, acts, uh, towns and acts, or intolerable acts, the first two are really the only ones that the colonists had to deal with. It was the... Uh, the act on stamped paper for official documents, which was, again, clearly focused on the wealthiest or the elite colonists. And then the one on sugar slash molasses, which was mostly used. The big, the re, the big effect there was to, uh, um, distill, uh, to distill it for rum. And of course, that being a drunk, uh, a drink of the wealthier classes, not necessarily, again, focused on all colonists. And again, refresh my memory, Nick, why did the British pass these two taxes to begin with, these two acts? What, I mean, are they just being tyrants? Are they wildly oppressive? That's probably not the case, as we talked about in that last episode, but let's refresh some memories here. So yeah, as we discussed, if you haven't listened to the previous episode, that's kind of the build up to this uh, moment. I definitely suggest you go back and do that. Um, but they're taxing the colonists to pay for the war. They just uh, won on behalf of the colonists. Yeah, the French and Indian War was started by colonists, so colonists can get land in the Ohio Valley. The British come to the rescue, empty the coffers to win this war, and uh, now seek recompense. And it's not just that war. The colonists then to colonize this new, newly opened Ohio Valley are dealing with, of course, naturally, a rightful Native American resistance. Well, that Native American resistance led by uh, important sachems like Pontiac, that scares the colonists. And of course, they're dealing with the fact that they need protection. So they ask British troops to stick around. Hey, protect us. Well, that costs money. And so when the colonists uh, are asked to, in some way, shape, or form, uh, compensate the British a little bit for this act that the British performed for them, both the war and the protection thereafter, the colonists are going to get quite upset. And that's kind of where we're picking up right now. And again, they're focusing their their quote-unquote oppressive measures on the elite colonists because, again, they know they're the ones benefiting most from – the opening up of the Ohio Valley. It's There's a company called the Ohio Company of Virginia, and they're there as land speculators and bankers and so on and so forth, and they're going to parcel this land off and sell it at interest to other colonists. They're rich. They're already wealthy. So again, the the fact they're going to get so angry is, is questionable at best, um, at least initially. Now, I will tell you, we're going to get to some points today where the British actually do start passing some pretty dumb taxes and actually undo some of the goodwill that they arguably created. Anyway... Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind here is that the British are going to see this as, again, these are acts of uh, that they have every right to implement in the colonies because these are their citizens. These are English citizens, and they are, in British minds, maybe not American ones, but in British minds, virtually represented in Parliament as British citizens in the House of Commons, and their rights are protected under the English Bill of Rights. We haven't got to that, but that's right, listeners. England already had a Bill of Rights. It's not an American invention. Uh, in fact, many of the ideas in there are borrowed, if not copied, from the British Bill of Rights, many of ours. Um, anyway, let's keep moving here. So, the other thing I want to focus on before we really get going... The American colonists, or yeah, let's just call them the American colonists. Technically, they're still British, but whatever. To make it easier for, for listeners to like get these two groups of people, we'll call them the American colonists. Already Although, had- hang on. I do think that that's so important, which I'm assuming we're going to touch on many times throughout this, is the idea that these are still British citizens. 
I I always question when in this like historical story do we start to use the term American because they didn't view themselves as American. If anything, they might have viewed themselves as like the colony they lived in, but they surely weren't American at this point. So I, I don't know when that term is appropriate, but it's not at this point yet, but we might use it just because it's easy. We're going to start seeing it in some of these pamphlets we'll talk about later. We'll start seeing like the word American a little bit more common. But anyway, here's the other thing we have to keep in mind. Uh, the British citizens living here or the American colonists, whatever you prefer, already had the highest standard of living in the entire British Empire. They are not suffering whatsoever. At least the people that are going to be complaining. Yes, slaves are suffering. Indigenous people are suffering. Women are suffering. But the, the, the white dudes that are whining about these taxes are not suffering. They have the highest standard of living in the entire British Empire. Or well, maybe the uh, like the yeoman farmer might be suffering a little bit, but we'll get to them uh, later He's on. He's still doing better than a factory worker. Well, not they don't have full-blown factories yet. This is 1700s. But some sort of urban worker, right. urban laborer in yeah. London, he's doing a hell of a lot better than that guy. So they already have the highest standard of living. Why would they be so upset about having to recompensate the British government for winning these this war and protecting them from the Native Americans? It's it's very interesting. Uh, anyway, so let's dig into this a little bit. Some of the anger um, spills over into the creation of a new organization during this time period. And it is a very famous organization. They are called the Sons of Liberty. And while historical records don't provide us with like some sort of complete roster, it's not like you signed up for every meeting you went to or organization or action, there are a couple of famous names that we know uh, definitely associated with the Sons of Liberty. You as listeners will recognize the names of Samuel Adams um, as an actual actor, not because there's a horrific beer uh, named after him. John Hancock, because his, uh, his signature is super famous. Uh, Patrick Henry, uh, Benedict Arnold, who will be also famous during the combat portion of the War for Independence, uh, and Paul Revere, just to name a few off the top of my head. These are some important people we know that were associated with the Sons of Liberty or outright Sons of Liberty. And again, there's many more. Now, the thing we have to keep in mind is all of these uh, individuals come from pretty well, at least the famous names, uh, since we don't have rosters of everybody, I don't, I can't, I guess I can't make a blanket statement, but at least of the names that we know of that are associated with the Sons of Liberty all come from pretty well off families, have pretty good material bases, and, uh, probably have the least amount of gripes or should have the least amount of gripes with their status in society at that moment in time. And it's something we're going to see quite often in revolutionary history, uh, not just in the United States, but other revolutions as well. In some of the other classes Nick and myself teach, we see that oftentimes revolutions, or at least attempted revolutions, at the end of this we'll debate whether this is even revolutionary or not, but that's that's a later conversation. Let's pretend it's a revolution for now. Revolutionary movements tend to not happen from the actual like grassroots bottom of the social pyramid or social ladder. They actually come from usually the middle or upper middle classes of society. I'm going to ask my sociologist here, Nick, why is that the case? Why is it never – why are the revolutions, even though we want them to romanticize them as like the lower classes rising up against the oppressive uh, oppressive regime, it's actually never them. It's the almost haves that usually lead the revolutions, and they don't want to flip society. They merely want to exchange who's at the top of the pyramid with themselves. Yeah, I mean pragmatically, the people at the very, very bottom of any society – literally are just living day to day they don't have time to organize a revolution they don't have time to sit around and pontificate about uh what they you know different revolutionary theories and like all this kind of discourse they don't have time for that they're just literally trying to survive as jared says usually it's the people that uh might have a little leisure time on their hands uh, that aren't living day to day you know quote unquote paycheck to paycheck uh so and we see that's absolutely true when we talk about the american war for independence in fact it doesn't even come from the almost haves it's coming from the most elite in society so and these elite yeah these young again very privileged elite men form this organization and they decide that they are going to take to the streets uh, rather violently and to give you an example of some of the things they would do uh of course Uh, I have a primary source. We love to use these primary sources, so let's talk about it. We have a primary source from Thomas Hutchinson from 1765, where he recounts the reaction to the Stamp Act in Boston. Now, Thomas Hutchinson is not necessarily the best, like, 
figure from this time period. He's the governor of Boston. He is a he is a British official, um, and he definitely has some skeletons in his closet as well. But his recounting of the events uh, orchestrated by the Sons of Liberty in reaction to the Stamp Act are kind of interesting. So this is what he has to say. And again, I'm not going to read the whole thing verbatim. I'm going to pick out the the juicy excerpts, of course. He says, a few days after, early in the morning, a stuffed image was hung upon a tree called the Great Tree of the South Part of Boston, subsequently called Liberty Tree. Labels were affixed, denoted it to be designed for the distributor of stamps. This is very interesting to me because uh, basically what they did is there's a famous tree, and, and most of our listeners are probably aware of this if they've been to Boston or have done, done some historical research here. This Liberty Tree, uh, it's got a nice name. It's all about liberty. But at one point in time, it was used as propaganda to hang stuffed effigies of tax collectors. And in the grand scheme of things, that's not like super controversial or I, – I, I don't know. I mean what are your thoughts on this? Basically what you're doing is you're hanging the stuffed effigy, effigy of a tax collector. In this case, his name is Andrew Oliver. We'll get to him in a second. It's like a threat. You're not actually hanging the guy, so I guess people let them off the hook for this. But what are your thoughts on this? I mean does this constitute unfounded violence? What do you think, Nick? Yeah, it like you say, it toes the line between whether or not we would consider it violence. Um, it might be a call to violence, you know, if we're using our like modern free speech like nomenclature. Um, but I think we do need to stress, which we're about to get into, that this time was much, much more violent than we typically think of. Even though we're taught that it's a war, we still kind of think that somehow the leading up to the war and like this movement overall wasn't violent. But in common terms, this is very violent. And I would say probably the hanging of a, an effigy of a tax collector and beating them or setting them on fire or et cetera, that's, we could probably consider that a violent act. And you couldn't get away with something like that today. Definitely. Uh, so that's interesting that our state founded on revolutionary processes would not allow its own citizens to do things that help found the state. But that's, that's a different argument. Although I did just see a news article where at some, I don't know what the party was, but they were hitting a pinata that was an ICE agent, which I thought was interesting. Oh, maybe I guess you, okay, mm -hmm. all right, well, there you go. All right, anyway, Hutchinson continues. He says, this mob followed down King Street to Oliver's dock. Again, Oliver is the tax collector, Andrew Oliver. Near where Mr. Oliver, near which Mr. Oliver had lately erected a building which it was conjectured he designed for a stamp office. This was laid flat to, to the ground in a few minutes. Okay, so now it's, now we've gone up a level. This is no longer just ha hanging an effigy, some representation of a tax collector. We've gone down to this guy's dock and destroyed his property. Absolutely destroyed his property. Yep. Now what's the problem? I mean, this is the throwing a brick through a window equivalent, right? Yeah, and we lose our minds in modern society when we see, like, anything bad happen to a business during a protest or during a riot or anything. We Oh, millions of dollars were caused in the Watts riots or the Newark riots or whatever, and it's, it's, it's absolutely a joke. Like, we're more concerned about the property now. Well, here we see this social movement also destroyed property for what some might say no good reason. Mm -hmm. Hutchinson continues... It was reported that the people of Connecticut had threatened to hang their distributor on the first tree after he entered the colony, and that to avoid it, he had turned aside to Rhode Island, despairing for protection, and finding his family in terror and great distress. Mr. Oliver came to a sudden resolution to resign his office before another night. So the uh, the, the sons in Connecticut threatened to hang their distributor, and it gets them to – he basically skips out and goes to Rhode Island. And now Mr. Oliver – or Andrew Oliver is even more scared – he actually feels finding his family in terror. His family is in terror. I'm emphasizing that word. Some listeners will know why. And great distress. Mr. Oliver came to a sudden resolution to resign his office before another night. They got what they wanted, I guess. The guy quit his job, so it worked. So they used fear and violence for a political goal. Interesting. Moving forward, on the evening of... Uh, the 26th of August, a mob was collected again on King Street, drawn there by a bonfire and well supplied with strong drink. Interesting. It's like a, it's like a frat party. I, I don't, whatever. Okay. After some annoyance to the House of the Register of the Admiralty and somewhat greater to that of the Comptroller of Customs, whose cellars they plundered of the wine and spirits in them, they came with intoxicated rage upon the house of the Lieutenant Governor. The doors were immediately split to pieces with broad axes and a way made there, and at the windows for the entry of the mobs, which poured in and filled in an instant every room in the house. So these guys, again, these sons of liberty, 
get drunk off of stolen alcohol from government officials and then begin to break into their homes. What do you think of that? We don't tell this when we talk about the heroic patriots of the, or the sons of liberty. Yeah, we don't talk about the drunken mob just going and with an axe knocking down the door and ransacking some guy's house. We again, leave that part out. Keep in mind, we wouldn't be allowed to do any of these things today in a country that was founded on these things. Yep. Interesting. There's a very rich commentary to be had on how acts of violence as uh, protests have been erased from the narrative of our country, uh, but that's for another time. John Adams uh, is witnessing the events over the over the years of the Sons of, of Liberty, and uh, to the best of our knowledge, and if if we're wrong, correct us in the comments. But yeah, to the best of our knowledge, he was not one. And his, uh, his allusion in his diary entry from August 15th of 1765 is kind of interesting. He says, but to be carried through the town in such insolent triumph and burned on a, on a hill, to have his garden torn to pieces, his house broken open, his furniture destroyed, and his whole family thrown into confusion and terror. That is now the second time we've seen that word. This time from John Adams himself, future second president of the United States is a very atrocious violation of the peace and dangerous, ten dangerous tendency and consequence. So this is John Adams critiquing the Sons of Liberty. So this is a quote-unquote founding father critiquing the Sons of Liberty. Why don't we dig as deep into this? No, I mean, we assume they're all the same people with all the same goals and all the same tactics. That's how we're taught in, again, the wildly inadequate K-12 through system. Why don't we dig into this nuance? I mean, yeah, we don't want people to think that violence is a means to make change. We don't want them to think that the country, the beginning of the turmoil of this era was the destroying of people's property, the stealing of their alcohol, the threatening them to be hanged, the et cetera, et cetera. Oh, we're not done. There actually was violence committed on individuals. And in every modern definition, some might call this uh, I guess I shouldn't say every and then some. Let's say some might call this torture. Tarring and feathering was a popular thing that took place, not just in the buildup to the war, but during the war and even in some of its immediate aftermath. Um, tarring and feathering is uh, is torture. You have to pour hot tar on individuals. And of course, they're tarring either British officials, loyalists, or Tories. They're, they, these are the people that they're they're tarring and feathering throughout the entire war process. Again, this is hot tar, probably over two to 250 degrees. It's not street tar, which is even hotter than that. They didn't have, you know, whatever asphalt and pavement back then. So it's, it's tree tar, usually pine tar. Um, and then one other tree, which I'm, it's escaping me right now, but it was usually some sort of tree tar. And you pour this burning hot tar on people. That's torture. You then feather them to make mo it's, you're mocking them. Now, the good news, I guess, for uh, Sons of Liberty apologists out there, which I'm willing to bet a good portion of you are, is that of the 17 cases I've looked at, nobody died immediately from this torture. But it is still torture. Mm -hmm. The bad news, however, is once that tar hardens on the skin, it has to come off. And when you begin to peel it off, your skin comes with it. And this is the late 1700s. Open wounds are not a good thing in the late 1700s. Medicine is not good enough to, to, to deal with infections. So of those 17 cases, I have not been able to track down enough records. And, and I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm saying I might be inadequate as a historian on this specific topic to find out who actually caught infections that adversely affect their life or maybe even cause death later on. I, I have not followed up on those medical records, and they may or may not exist. Again, if somebody knows of them, feel free in the comments. Give us the source. But again, skin coming off all over your body, open wounds, 1700s, this is wildly problematic, and this is outright violence against individuals. I mean, even if you've just got like room temperature tree sap on your skin and tried to get it off, you can imagine what this is like. Even Thomas Hutchinson's house 
the governor would eventually bur be burned down, and there's not really any oppressive direct police-style recourse against the Sons of Liberty. Now, there will be legislative recourse, which will be problematic, and we'll get to in a second, but no no direct police... Again, they're, they're, the British are not walking through the streets with shields and whatever, like, again, banging them and tear gassing. I'm just kidding, because none of that stuff existed. <laughs> um, but no, there was no immediate police recourse to these actions of tarring and feathering and burning down governor's homes and uh, uh, hanging effigies and whatever else we've discussed, laying flat to the ground, um, tax collecting offices. I mean, you can't do that now, so, but we were founded on it. Maybe we should be allowed to go down to the IRS building. And if you don't agree with what's going on there with like a bulldozer, I don't know. How would that go? Bring us straight up to Denver and uh, burn down the governor's mansion. See how that goes? Yeah, that's not going to go well for us. But again, the fact that the, the sons were able to get away with all this shows how actually, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, restrained the British actually were like that. That shows an incredible amount of restraint on England's part and the English officials to not just go wreck shop. Mm -hmm. It's not like they didn't know who some of these individuals were. They could have. It shows an incredible amount of restraint, in my opinion. I actually have two more notes from my notes on the Sons of Liberty. Um, so you said that they finally convinced Oliver to give up his position. They did that, but then that wasn't enough for them. He did that to them personally. He ma they made him go and in front of the town publicly announced that he had given up his position. So it wasn't just good enough that he did it in front of them. Also, he ends up dying in 1774 and the Sons of Liberty protest his funeral. I just want, that's super important for us to understand. Huh. Sounds like, uh, I don't know, a certain unpopular place or church in Kansas that kind of does something similar there. Hmm. Interesting. Weird. Yep. Okay. Moving forward. And again, like, I mean, let's go back to even the Protestant work ethic and all the things that we've already talked about in this podcast. Why are these elite white men in American history acting like spoiled children? Entitlement. That's what we said last time. Straight up just entitlement. I mean, that's it. I don't know. The, there's some kind of like weird cognitive dissonance that these taxes imposed by the British s somehow are jeopardizing your quality of living when you're living in the, you have the highest standard of living in the entire British Empire. Keep in mind, again, these are just the white elites that are super pissed about this. Citation on highest standard of living is Wim Clooster, Atlantic Revolutions, in case you're curious. Yeah, we'll post a ton of sources um, yeah. in the comments of this episode for sure. Okay. Um. Now, let's get to, let's switch gears for just a second. Now, let's beat up the British a little bit. I told you they didn't react with a lot of police recourse. They did act with some legislative recourse, which I would argue is dumb. It's dumb because uh, in revolutionary theory, there's, th there's this idea out there, at least for nonviolent protests, that you can make oppression backfire and you can actually get your oppressor, whoever you have targeted as your oppressor, to actually make poor choices where they actually do look like the asshole now. And it... It, this did happen. The Townsend Acts reveal, or at least reveal, they coerce the British into passing these acts that are now somewhat, now affect more of the population than just the elite. Um, and they're passed between 1767 and 1770 by the financial minister, Charles Townsend. He gets Parliament to finally respond to the outlandish behavior of the colonial leaders. And so what these acts Basically, these acts, I'm not going to go through each one individually like I did with the Sugar Act or the Stamp Act. I'm just going to go through the, I'm just basically going to say these, there were duties placed on tea, glass, paper, lead, and paint, and a few other popular products, which basically raised their prices. So again, for the common consumer that used these things, basically you're paying a higher price. Here's the problem. Instead of things like rum or official documents, now you are actually adding the price to things that like basically everybody uses, especially things like tea or just regular paper, uh, paints. Like that's a problem. That now is a problem because you are now basically – so even if regular everyday uh, uh, American colonists or British colonists didn't buy into what the Sons of Liberty were doing, and they didn't. They didn't have a lot of support. Believe it or not, they did not have a lot of support. Most Americans already recognize they had the highest standard of living. It's because the British are here. We're not ready to give up our comfort for whatever it is you're yelling about. Yeah, but, I want to stress at this yeah. point, still the vast majority of the colonists, none of them give a shit about what's going on. They don't care. They're still loyalists. Yeah, either that or they're just too busy. Like, again, if you have your own nice little plot of land out in the boondocks of wherever, 
very, very far West Virginia or some – not the state, but Western Virginia – What's going on in Boston means nothing to you. You're not even really hearing about it. It doesn't mean a lot to you. Um, most colonists didn't care. But now that their tea, something they drink, costs a lot more, yeah, that's going to start – that's going to garner attention. So now you actually might start paying attention to what these crazy sons of liberty are saying. So this is where the British, again, make a poor choice. They're basically now validating the, the behavior of the sons of liberty. Poor choice by the British. Yep. Poor choice. Here's the other part that makes it even worse. The duties from these products would be paid to pay the British officials in the colonies. So that those duties are not going back to England uh, to pay them back for the French and Indian War or to pay them back for protection on the western border from indigenous peoples. These duties are going basically to pay what the colonists can consider their immediate oppressor, the officials representing the crown in the colonies, yeah, which so basically makes them targets. Yeah, you're very visibly paying a tax to pay the person's salary that's oppressing you and collecting the yeah, tax. the so, British were yeah. not smart here, and we have to call them out. We defended them a little bit earlier, which I almost never do in history. It's like the only time in history I ever do it, but whatever. We can't defend them on this. This was an absolutely ridiculous choice. Um, so – uh, and and then here, they take it a step further. Charles Townsend, when he meets protest here in this regard from the assemblies that they allowed uh, the colonists to have in New York and Boston, he suspends and dismisses them. So there are like – again, you're allowed to have some local representation here in the colonies if you're an American colonist and you have these assemblies in these various cities. And when they begin to balk at these new duties, Townsend in New York suspends them, the assembly, and then in Boston completely dismisses them. That's a poor choice. Excuse me. I guess the Boston Assembly is dismissed by Hutchinson, not Townsend. But still, it's the same effect. They're dismissed by the British officials. In this atmosphere, I now want to talk about a much more, and this is our, our bias here, effective and efficient uh, form of protest during this time. And this comes from the Daughters of Liberty. So the Daughters of Liberty uh are, there is definitely some crossover in relation with Sons of Liberty or Founding Fathers. Like there was, again, just like with the Sons of Liberty, we don't have an entire roster um, of the women, although there is there is one signed agreement that shows at least 538 uh, women agreed um, against the duty uh, for tea. But we don't have like, again, an entire roster of these amazing women, what they were able to accomplish uh, serving as the Daughters of Liberty. The main tactic that they chose was not getting drunk and burning things in the street or hanging effigies uh, or tarring and feathering other human beings. They decided to actually take things on using something called direct action, which became famous later during like civil rights. What they decided the best thing they could do was be non-consumptive. So non-consumption means that they're not going to consume these British products of which a duty was placed upon them, and thus the British don't get what they want. You're basically hitting the British, your oppressor, in the wallet. The British, the entire colonial enterprise is here to make money and profit. We know that. So if the British can't make money and profit, you're hurting them much more than, again, hanging like dolls from trees. Why are the Daughters of Liberty so much smarter in this strategy than the Sons of Liberty? I don't know, like the dudes are just getting all together and getting drunk and it sounds good to drive an axe through someone's door and steal their alcohol. I don't, I don't know. We're idiots. That's yeah. Funny. We're idiots. We're idiots. Anyway, some of the more notable names that we do know were Daughters of Liberty include um, Eleanor Fry, Mary Lawton, um, some of the more famous ones that would have association later with the uh, Oval – well, not the Oval Office. It hadn't been built yet. But with the uh, the presidency would be Abigail Adams and Martha Washington and, of course – uh, a super interesting case study would be Deborah Sampson, where she was a daughter of liberty, but then took it to the next level when the war broke out and actually pretended to be a man so she could actually serve and fight in the Continental Army. So she took this to a whole new level. Before I get into um, some of the other things that the Daughters of Liberty did, I'm going to ask Nick, as I would ask my students in a class, why don't we have a mountain where we've carved the faces of Eleanor Fry or Mary Lawton or Abigail Adams or Deborah Sampson? Why don't we have a mountain with their faces carved into it? Because they're women and we very, very much so as much as possible try to erase the role of any non-white, non-male people from this story. And if you're a new listener, I want you to ask yourself this question. 
Why did not why did your K through 12 teacher not ever even bring up the Daughters of Liberty? Cuz I already know what happened. I already know at least specific to Colorado what's in the curriculum and the Daughters of Liberty are glossed over completely even though they were much more effective in creating change than the Sons of Liberty. They're completely glossed over. Mm-hmm. These are the mo- most important women that contributed to the creation of the United States and most of you have never heard of those names I just put into this microphone. Which is interesting because you think nowadays they could, you know, be a uh... What's the word Foucault uses? Uh, It's escaping me right now. Exhumed. Their history could be exhumed and shared more widely nowadays in modern times. And even that hasn't happened. We've now, it's just, the story has become so sacred that we don't even want to add parts to it that would be beneficial to keep it going today. There are some parts of it that even though they seem sort of innocent, uh, still threaten the overall myth. Because if we start admitting that there are parts of it that we haven't been telling, even if they are good parts, uh, it just jeopardizes the whole legitimacy of the story overall. Not only are they wildly effective at hitting the British where it hurts the most in the wallet, um, they're even more, uh, their actions are even more imperative to creating an independence minded ethos, both like, again, maybe I shouldn't say both, but ethos ideally and materially. And this is how. See, the, doster- the Daughters of Liberty fostered independence in production. The colonists still needed the items that the daughters had taught them how to boycott, and thus they learned how to produce them on their own. So things like tea, they would learn how to grow it in their backyard. Sometimes they would try different interesting teas on, like basil tea, which doesn't sound like super delicious to me. But basically they were experimenting and trying on these different ways to get this tea. Um, And as I already mentioned, 538 women, we definitely know, signed agreement uh, against the, of course, duty on the tea. Uh, one of the more popular things they had uh, engaged in were these things called spinning bees. They would produce their own goods, not just tea, but in this case, textiles. Um, and these shirts that they would produce, or these clothes, these textiles that they would produce from homespun cotton and, and, and whatnot, these, clo- these pieces of clothing, would actually become popular. They would actually become symbols of the movement. And here's the key component here. We know that during all social movements or revolutions, what have you, that being part of the in or being part of the no or being part of the crowd is actually wildly important and can attract actually new followers or new subscribers to your movement. People sometimes just want to be part of something new and novel and cool. And these shirts or these clothes, these textiles represented that. So if you were seen in the streets of a Boston or a Richmond or wherever you might be and you happen to have uh, acquired one of these uh, homespun pieces of of clothing and people would ask you about it, that actually entered or opened up an opportunity for you to discuss the movement. Because again, for some people, they're still ignorant to this movement. We're still in the 1760s. It's not full blown yet. Yeah, there's a lot of recruiting, a lot of symbolism here, right? With the Liberty tea and the homespun clothing. And yeah, they're creating the the meaning in these things, right? It means something. It means self-sufficiency. It means being anti-British taxation. It means being, uh, you know, all of these things. Yeah, it's key. This is also outright politicization of women. These women were not just like sitting there spinning. These spinning bees would also be a place for civic engagement by women, which in certain cases, in certain towns, they, that was something they had not done before. Mm -hmm. So this is an act, um, not just challenging the British, but this is an act of challenging the patriarchy. Um, which is, again, so often glossed over when we learn this uh, part of uh, U.S. history, uh, especially during the American War for Independence. Um, why else? I mean, is there any other reason that we skipped over? Why might the Daughters of Liberty be so glossed over? In, in not, it's not even just K-12. through 12. We pick on K-12 through 12 so much, and, and it's hard to pick on a, a system that's so inadequately funded and, 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 and uh, staffed. But still... It's I, this would be ripe for an amazing Hollywood film or something like that. Why why don't we talk about these women? It jeopardizes the overall story. I also think that th- while their you know their actions are more mainstream and acceptable than burning down a house, they still threaten current society. The idea of you know a general strike, the idea of a boycott, etc. Those things still, even though they're nonviolent, are absolutely unacceptable in society today as ways to make change. And they're wildly efficient, right? When you do not buy any tea, you're going to get England's attention. We're all too weak now 
to do that. Uh, we're all, you know, flaccid little consumers and we can't deal with not having something that we like for more than, you know, a little bit. So I don't know that boycotts can be a thing anymore, but I mean, imagine like how quickly you would get what you want from, I don't know who's got a lot of power Verizon. If everyone just stopped using Verizon for a couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. they would, those rates would come right now. Yeah. Don't everyone get together and not pay your bill and watch how fast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I don't know why I chose Verizon off the top of my head, but whatever. It is what it is. Okay, moving on. Um, They even had – and this is a, a later. We're not to this point in history yet, but I feel like while we're talking about the Daughters of Liberty, I should at least cite it. They had their own little coffee party in 1777, and this was actually kind of violent. They actually assaulted – like again, they assaulted this uh, uh coffee merchant that basically had been hoarding coffee because coffee was also filling in as kind of like a uh, – a substitute for tea. Um, so yeah, there was this coffee party of 1777. It's a great story. Um, if you ever have the chance to to check it out and look it up. Um, I also want to discuss again, as we're kind of moving forward, the daughters of Liberty. It's not just about boycotts. It's not just about like non-consumption and it's not even just about producing your own goods. All of those three things combined contribute more to building the idea of independence than anything the Sons of Liberty ever did. And this is why. Let's be blunt. We like stuff. I just made fun of it like that. That's why we'll never see boycotts anymore. Well, we do. We do like stuff. And if you can be materially and economically independent, the natural next level would be political independence. Sons of Liberty didn't do any of that. Yep. They whined. They complained. They got drunk. They tarred and feathered people. They burned down people's homes. They assaulted people. I mean, we have to understand during this period, the increase in the material and ideological conditions that develop that give birth to this movement. And the Daughters of Liberty, in our opinions at least, do more to contribute to both the economic and the way of thinking that comes into being that really gets people going and fired up at the beginnings of this movement. Like Jared just said, if you can start thinking in ways where you start to realize you're not completely economically dependent on uh, the British in this specific example, that's hugely powerful. And you start to think in, uh, makes you think in different ways, right? Things escalate further uh, in 1768. When the British uh, have now make their second straight poor decision. Like I said, we let them off the hook for the tax and stamp acts or the sh- 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 whatever. The sugar and stamp acts, excuse me. Because honestly, they were rightfully owed those compensations for winning the French and Indian War and protecting people from Pontiac's Rebellion. They were owed those. The towns and acts are much less defensible. We can't really defend those. That's That's taking it to a new level. Uh, especially when you're now not just like focusing on the elite wealthy colonists, you're focusing on all the colonists with your um, uh, taxes. The second straight poor choice the British would make was stationing 3,000 troops in Boston alone in 1768 to quote-unquote ease tensions. Let's be blunt. The stationing of military troops anywhere at any time in history, never eases tensions. Maybe it, I don't know. If somebody can think of an example, feel free to, to let us know. But like stationing troops, again, armed people, does not ease tensions. I've always liked to I kind of laugh at, chuckle at the term like a peacekeeping military mission. Like that's an oxymoron. I don't, that's, yeah, that's, that's not a thing. There is no such thing. The UN peacekeeping force, the United States, keep, like, like get out of here. You're liars. Mm-hmm. You're liars. You, you're not, there's no, you're peacekeeping through oppression. Cool. That's not peace. Yeah, and violence. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. Well, we can't have peace unless we have – like that old adage, especially in Western civilization, and this dates back before like the United States. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking Roman crusader, like like, whatever, all of it. Like that idea that to get to peace, we'll have war first is like the most asinine assumption I've ever (laughs) – Yeah. What idiot believes that? Mm -hmm. You got to be a complete moron. To buy into that idea that to get peace, we just have to go to war first. We just have to kill a bunch of people and then all will be peaceful. It never, yeah, and there won't be any reprisals and everybody's going to be cool with it. Like that never happened. Like 
Oh, I mean, history is evidence enough to prove that that absolutely is Yeah, we've been in asinine. perpetual war, yeah. right? The United States, many American citizens firmly believe this, and that's why the country has been at war between 80 and 90% of its entire history. Oh, we love peace so much. Then why have we been at war for 80 to 90% of our history? Yeah, we literally have never had it. And I use the, 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 the gap there because there are different sources that debate on certain wars against indigenous people if they actually count as war or not. But whatever. 80 to 90% of the time we're at war. Mm-hmm. The hell's wrong with us? Yeah, we've never oh, seen peace. Oh, but we love peace. peace. Yeah. I'm super peaceful. Yep. Yeah. Get out of here. All right. Anyway, um, these troops uh, do not ease tension. Thanks, Britain. And rioters and looters begin to or continue to deface officials' homes. Eventually, the Sons of Liberty and, and some of their other followers and affiliated followers or affiliated people um, – Gather around one of the officials' homes. His name is Ebenezer Richardson. He was a customs official. And um, they begin to throw rocks and various things through his windows, and he gets scared. Um, He is a customs official. I'm not saying he's a nice man by any stretch of the imagination. But this drunken crowd, again, around him, defacing his home and throwing things through his window is going to lead to a poor reaction on his part, but a reaction that might be pseudo-understandable. I don't know. The audience can can whatever, decide for themselves. Anyway, one of the rocks goes through the window and strikes his wife, which, of course, is going to set this man off. And so he uh, fires uh, his weapon. He has, obviously, a whatever, a musket, whatever they called him back then. That, yeah, that's definitely what they called him. Yeah. yeah, whatever. <laughs> he fired a stick that goes boom. Yeah. Um, anyway, he fired a stick that goes boom out into the crowd, and he does. He strikes a 12-year-old boy named Christopher Sider. And uh, he dies. I mean, he dies. He kills this kid. He kills a 12-year-old kid. Now, why this kid was at a violent protest at all could be debated, um, although things were definitely different in the 1770s. Um, but here's the key component. They turn young Christopher Sider, uh, shot by Ebenezer Richardson, into a martyr. And a propaganda campaign begins – uh, by the Sons of Liberty to turn this thing into like it's a spectacle. They make a spectacle of this this young boy's funerary procession. It's interesting that they turn this into a spectacle because again, I, I you know obviously I'm willing to bet the parents, or maybe I'm not willing to bet, but I'm assuming the parents were okay with their son's death being turned into a spectacle for a political goal. Um, but why is this idea of a young martyr? What's why is that important in revolutionary theory? So this is like the first person murdered. As a result of the movement, and this usually just lights a fire under the movement, depending on the circumstances uh, and so on. And we know that that's the case in this specific example, for sure. And on March 5th of 1770 in Boston, as this this spectacle is taking place, tension peaks. Eight soldiers, eight British soldiers are surrounded and taunted by a mass mob. We know that they fire into the crowd and wound 11 people and kill five people. This is more commonly known as the Boston Massacre, which is an interesting name for the death of five people. I do not want to denigrate or desecrate the death of these five people or or their names or anything along those lines. But massacre is a little bit, again, hyperbolic or propagandist, and that's not a bad thing in this case. What I'm saying is by calling it a massacre, you're gaining attention, and that's what the Sons of Liberty clearly are after at this moment in time. Um, but again, this is the Myth is America podcast. And when I see the word massacre and know that many of our listeners, uh, have never heard of what happened in Sand Creek, Colorado or at Wounded Knee, uh, I choke a little bit. Well, also it's interesting because we call it the siege at Wounded Knee. We don't call it the massacre at Wounded Knee. Yeah. Terminology is so important. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of First Nation peoples are just massacred by the United States military in both cases. It's just – or the My Lai – well, I guess we actually call My Lai a massacre, don't we? We do. All right. Anyway, whatever. Let's get back to the primary sources. What actually happened on March 5th of 1770? Well, we're going to go through uh, a couple of interesting – um, sources on this too, actually one, uh, a testimony and the other, a picture. It's going to be hard for me to do this with the picture since, uh, this is a podcast, but, uh, I'll describe it as best I can. And, and, and those of you that are on a computer can just like Google. It's the most famous image of the Boston massacre. So anyway, we'll start with the testimony. This comes from Samuel Drown, uh, on March 16th 
uh, of 1770. So you can see it's about 11 days after the actual quote unquote massacre takes place. And obviously these, uh, these British soldiers, these A soldiers are put on trial, right? For what happened. And oddly enough, John Adams is the one that will defend them. So again, future, again, United States Patriot, President, whatever you want to call him, is defending the British soldiers. Keep that in mind. Anyway, Samuel Drown's testimony. He says, by this time, uh, we were collected together in King Street, about 200 people. And then the deponent stood upon the steps of the Exchange Tavern, being the next house to the Custom House, and soon after saw Captain Preston, whom we well knew, with a number of soldiers armed with firelocks, drawn up near the west corner of the Custom House. And at that instant, the deponent thinks so great a part of the people were dispersed at the side of the armed soldiers as that no more than 20 or 30 remained in King Street. So that's the first thing that's important. At first, there were hundreds, like, again, this mob of hundreds. But when the soldiers show up, many of them run away. They flee. And so this mob is now down to about 20 to 30 people that is surrounding these soldiers. Those who did remain, being mostly sailors and other persons meanly dressed, called out to the armed soldiers and dared them to fire. Going to pause again. Most of the people that are left behind are sailors and people's meanly dressed. What could meanly dressed mean? I mean, these aren't women and children. That's the yeah, the, these are tough guys. Yeah. These are tough guys. Okay? And they're daring the soldiers to fire. Um, upon which the deponent then heard Captain Preston say to the soldiers... Damn your bloods, why don't you fire? The soldiers, not regarding those words of their captain, he immediately said, fire, upon which they fired irregularly, pointing their guns variously in a part of a circle as they stood. Cool, we have this account from Samuel Drown, and most of the other accounts are relatively similar, although some debate who said fire first, whether it was the crowd or Captain Preston. Regardless, we know that the soldiers end up basically getting off. Uh, a couple of them get a thumb branding. Um, but yeah, they basically get off because uh, it is determined what they did was relatively justified and relatively is the key term here. But let's go to a different account, the Sons of Liberty, is a, Sons of Liberty account. And this account comes up to us from very famous Son of Liberty and silversmith, Paul Revere. Um, so Paul Revere... Uh, well, I mean, I guess as a uh, as a silversmith was able to create an etching of a piece of art originally produced by Henry Pelham. And the reason the etching is important is because when you turn this image into an etching, you can it's mass produced, right? We've got printing presses. You can mass produce this image and flood uh, all the media outlets at the time with this image. So I want to describe the image super fast. Again, you can look it up. It's pretty famous. But the first thing you'll note in the image, uh, Paul Revere's etching of the Boston Massacre, actually titled The Bloody Massacre, um, is that the British are not surrounded. They're actually in what looks like a firing line. Well, we know at the testimony in the court cases, basically everyone acknowledged they're surrounded. But in this picture, again, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and probably more influential for the public because they don't know what's going on at this, this, this hearing. The British are in a firing line. And the second thing is they don't look scared like people are hurling things at them and, and, and giving them a whole bunch of slurs. They look almost happy, if not evil in a way. And Captain Preston is clearly behind them with his sword drawn in the air, ordering them to fire. And like I said, it looks just like a firing squad. They're in a perfect line and they're firing into a crowd, a crowd of people that are not necessarily meanly dressed or just sailors. I mean, there's even a dog in the crowd. I always like to emphasize, like, who shoots at a dog? Like, this is clearly propaganda, right? This is clearly propaganda. In the background behind the British soldiers, because there's two sides to the town here on King Street, on their side, it looks, all the buildings behind the British look like nice and elite and beautiful and well-maintained. And one of them's even called Butcher's Hall, right? They look wonderful. And on the colonist side, all of the buildings are kind of like older looking, maybe, I don't want to say dilapidated, but they look like lower class. And what we're seeing here is that's iconography, right? That is propaganda. The British, rich, oppressive, happy to be killing colonists. The colonists, ah, oh, just so poor, laying in pools of blood with their dog, and everyone's like sad, and look, they come from this like less wealthy part of town. The whole thing, it, it is master propaganda, because we know that's not what happened, and yet, and yet, that is the image that is pumped throughout the colonies. 
because yeah, Paul Revere turned say, it into an etching. Mm-hmm. He didn't even make this etching. He took someone else's etching and then reproduced it and made slight changes. So the other person doesn't even get credit. Jared mentioned his names. I don't remember his name. Henry what was Pelham. It? Henry Pelham. So he doesn't even get credit straight off. But then Paul Revere, because he was so well-connected to the other elites in society, mainly newspaper publishers, his image gets shared widely across uh, the colonies. And so this begins to shift and create this ideological narrative. It's interesting, we have to mention at this point, that we oftentimes, definitely the way this is presented when we learn about it in K-12, through etc., is like, it's very one-sided. The British massacred the innocent colonists. But you have to understand at the time, that isn't how people interpreted it. There was huge propaganda campaigns, both from the radical publications that would have published uh, Revere's engraving and from the loyalist uh, publications that were writing all about how the soldiers were egged on and completely justified in their actions. So this was a, an ideological battle to tell the story of this event uh, from two different sides. So it wasn't as if you know, the massacre narrative won the day. This was uh, highly, highly contested uh, during the time. So it's just important to think about that, that we aren't at a point yet where uh, this, you know, radical American sentiment has taken hold uh, by a long shot. Yeah. And it's into this atmosphere as we carry on through the early 1770s that a little bit more organization will come into the uh, colonial cause in this regard. And and the reason they want to be a little bit more organized than just letting the Sons of Liberty go ape everywhere they go or uh, follow the lead of the Daughters of Liberty because, well, they were misogynist at the time and would not necessarily want to follow the lead of the Daughters of Liberty. They decided to become a little bit at more the time? organized. Well, yeah, yeah. They, well, they were. Yeah, yeah, yes, the United States is still wildly misogynistic. <laughs> yes, that is a true statement. Um, They decide that they are going to uh, begin this more, again, organized campaign via pamphleteering and try and unite the colonies uh, basically through creating um, these uh, these committees of correspondence. And so what we see here is, especially in Boston, this was an important tactic for colonists that were upset to try and grow their movement. These pamphlets circulated and served to recruit people through rhetoric, philosophy, appeals to emotion, sometimes even fear, uh, and sometimes rationale. Really, many different ways. And many historians debate whether or not the early movement was even class-based, because we've, we, we've laid it out as relatively class-based. At first, it's the elite that are really the ones that are pissed off, and everybody else just doesn't, doesn't care. Um, and eventually that might change, but that's kind of our lens, but historians still debate this. The wealthy seeking to convince the rest to join, uh, comes from two notable examples. The historian Charles Beard, who's really famous, argues that the lower classes were co-opted through his study of the Federalist Papers and the founding legal documents in an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States. Um, but contrasting, we have also Bernard Balin, that through his study of the pamphlets, argues that there was much more of a general ethos for independence from a wider spectrum in his work, The Ideological Origin of the American Revolution. Um, Interpretation of history is, of course, subjective, and that's why I wanted to cite both of these guys. We tend to side a little bit more with Charles Beard's uh, uh, argument that it was it was heavily class based at least initially than Bernard Balin's, but Bernard Balin's work on like pamphleteering and influence and again ideology is it was groundbreaking. It's like still a go to text uh, for this time period. I, I don't remember when it was published nineteen fifty something sixty something. I don't know. Anyway, um, they're both amazing works, and we highly recommend uh, you all to take a look at those. It's also during this time that the Virginia House of Burgesses uh, officially crafted the Virginia Resolves under the guidance of Patrick Henry. Yes, it is the liberty or death guy, that guy, who uh, who also kind of used this colonist as slaves metaphor, um, which is interesting. And I kind of want to I want to talk about that a little bit. If we look at some of the pamphlets, um, we have to understand that using certain words and language, one of the earlier pamphlets was a pamphlet or a letter called Ignorance is Slavery. Using certain words, it, it was. It was meant to trigger a reaction um, among, of course, the audience. And the use of the word slavery, I want to really emphasize at this moment in time, again, when you're throwing it out there, whether we're talking about you know some of these pamphlets or we're talking about Sam, uh, uh, not Sam Adams, Patrick Henry, whoever else, these men, I guess I should just flat out say it. These men owned human beings, Patrick Henry, especially. They owned human beings. And their argument that what England was doing through this taxation was equivalent 
to the slavery that they enacted is one of the most offensive and disgusting parts of this time period. I want to stop and say that again. Men that owned human beings and profited from their labor and sold their children and abused them and whipped them had the audacity, had the balls to insinuate that some taxes were the same thing. What are your thoughts on that? It's clearly rhetoric. I mean, they probably believed it, but in this case, yeah, they, they want to get a reaction. And they themselves might even believe it, but that's, that's an atrocity in and of itself. Um, I mean, they're... they're their morality is questionable at best already for so many different reasons. So I, there's no defending the use of this language here. But we make these men Clearly. heroes. Yep. Yeah, that's our country. That's America. This is America. It's ridiculous. Hmm. Anyway, aside from the, the, the slavery argument, and like I said, it makes numerous appearances in countless pamphlets. And again, it's just it's it's appalling on so many levels. And 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 you know what? Before you even begin. And I know some of you are already beginning to think, well, it's just the time period. Slavery was just a thing. Oh, no, we're not there yet, but there were people already calling out these idiots for their slave-owning practices at the time. So we, they, can't, they can't feign ignorance to the fact that their behavior was morally reprehensible. Because people like Abigail Adams and Thomas Paine would argue, hey, if you're trying to create something super new and super better, you probably shouldn't do that. And they chose to continue to do it. Well, we already talked about that in the Invention of Whiteness episode. People were already calling them out. And that was 100 years before this. Right. Awful. Awful people. I, I mean, we love them. We love them. We love them. Oh, but there's like this moral gray area where you can't like just judge everybody like good or bad. Everybody does good things and bad things. Yeah, but the bad things were owning human beings. This was not lying on taxes. So this <laughs> so they probably like, did that too. Yeah. This wasn't, this wasn't like shoplifting some whatever, some shoes. Shoes would be harder to shoplift than like a pencil or something. I don't know why I chose shoes. That's weird. Anyway, whatever. Like this is this is big. This is a big deal. Okay. I mean, this is ju- this is the one of the biggest of many hypocrisies that the founding fathers with, you know, quote unquote perpetuated it's just ridiculous to give listeners a little bit of an example of what some of the pamphlets like might say as far as like trying to gain gain traction gain followers gain subscribers um piss people off in some cases uh this one's called the votes and proceedings of the freeholders and other inhabitants of the town of boston it's more famously just called the boston pamphlet which is arguably the most famous of any of the pamphlets that were put together at this time that'll all change when a a guy named thomas Paine comes along but regardless uh, it, this is this is what it had to say on November twentieth of seventeen seventy two. Gentlemen, we, the freeholders and other inhabitants of Boston, in town meeting, duly assembled according to law, apprehending there is a abundant reason to be alarmed that the plan of despotism in italics, which the enemies of our invaluable rights have concerted, is rapidly ha- rapidly hastening hastening to completion. They're calling the British despots. More rhetoric. Just more rhetoric. It is not a despotism. It is a constitutional monarchy, and there are numerous corruptions within it, but it is not a despotism. One can can no longer conceal our impatience under a constant, unremitted, uniform aim to enslave us or confide in our administration which threatens us with certain and inevitable destruction. Holy shit with the rhetoric here. Oh my God, the the British king and parliament are enslaving these poor, rich, white dudes. I just, mm-hmm. it's so, oh God, a tax on some stamps, maybe some tea. Oh my God. It's just like being worked in a field all day. It's the same thing, right? It's the same damn thing. It's just like having your children sold off to other families down the road. It's just like being whipped. Having your ear cut off as proof of purchase. It's the same thing, right? Iron muzzle on and on. Yeah. The balls. The balls on these people. And here, it's for their destruction. Why would the British want to destroy their colonists? Their colonists are profitable. They're making money. But when in addition to the repeated inroads made upon the rights and liberties of the colonists and those of this uh, and those in this province in particular, we reflect on the late extraordinary measure in affixing stipends or salaries from the crown. 
here we see, when we're talking about this, this idea that we're merging ridiculous rhetoric, as I just called them out on, with actual like sound like this is why we're really pissed off. They basically synthesize the two. And this is where now I'm going to pause for a second in my hyperbole and say for a second, I don't know that maybe they even really believe these things themselves. What are they doing? I mean, it's a super good tactic of propaganda and marketing, actually, to tie in half-truths or just straight-out lies and hyperbole with a little bit of truth because it makes it very, very difficult for people to determine which is which. Uh, here's another one uh, from April 9th of 1773. Uh, this one is, yeah, April 9th, 1773. I received the papers you sent me and am much obliged to you for them. Our assembly, sitting a few days after, they were of use to us. You will see by the enclosed resolutions the true sentiments of this colony, and that we are endeavoring to bring our sister colonies into the strictest union with us, that we may resent in one body any steps that may be taken by administration to bribe, deprive any one of us of the least particle of our rights and liberties. So in this one, we're seeing right off the bat, what's revealed to us is this one is meant to garner attention in other colonies, just like these committees of correspondence. That's their main goal. It is correspondence. And then to, at times, publish these findings to build momentum. Um, we should have done more, but we could procure nothing but news, uh, paper accounts of the proceedings in Rhode Island. I hope we shall not be thus kept in the dark for the future and that we shall have from the different committees, the earliest intelligence of any motion that be made by the tyrants. If you're wondering why I yelled, that word is in all caps in this, in this rendition. It is the tyrants in England to carry their infernal, that's also in all caps, purposes of enslaving us into the, into execution. So again, at first, we're like, hey, we're all just trying to meet, re meet, or get all this information through correspondence in these different colonies, and we're hoping to hear what's going on in Rhode Island, and oh yeah, we're slaves again. Like, they just, it just, it's worked right in there. I do love the all caps. Like, we think yeah. we're all new on the internet with the all caps. Like, they no. had this back in the day. No, people Nothing, have been all capping, yeah. they've been yelling via caps <laughs> for a really long time. It's caps. Oh my gosh. Anyway, whatever. You all get the idea of what I kind of get, get, get moving in this episode. We're going to kind of wind it down here in a few minutes. Um, I do want to take a minute though, just to talk about why pamphlets were so influential and in like kind yeah. of sort of the news of the time. Um, it's really, really important to understand the influence of these writings because nowadays we're like, okay, they wrote pamphlets, but you have to understand that this was one of the main strategies for garnering support and changing people's minds and winning the hearts and minds, right, of the people that they wanted to start believing in an independence movement. And it was really the main way that people got any kind of information. You basically had the pamphlets. If you lived in a city that was big enough, then there would be broadsides, so essentially the side of a building where anyone could post any kind of notice or anything like that. And then you had the newspapers. That was that was the three. That was really the only ways that you possibly got any news of the goings-on, whether it was in your specific city or what was going on in the rest of the colonies. So we see the publication of uh, things on broadsides frequently through this period, uh, often anonymously, which I think is kind of interesting to think about the fact that people didn't have to put themselves out there. They published these things anonymously, and then the public just kind of digested them as they saw fit. Then we see the pamphlets, like Jared just gave us a couple of examples of, uh, that were distributed widely. So if you're, you know, taking your... A horse into town or whatever, you'll come across people with all of these different pamphlets and you're sharing this information. And then the newspapers, we all know how newspapers work. Um, so that's how they were able to foment sort of this revolution at the time was using these three main ways to spread uh, news and ideas. And as Jared just said, often with ridiculous hyperbole spread throughout. Okay. So moving forward again, we're going to wind this one down here. Um, I do need to, before we do that, again, along the timeline, we need to talk about the fact that some of these strategies actually kind of worked from maybe some of the violence of the Sons of Liberty, although I don't want to give them a lot of credit, to the boycotts and uh, uh, non-consumption of the Daughters of Liberty, to the pamphleteering. Um, yeah, maybe some of it worked because Lord Frederick North comes along and actually repeals all of the duties from the Townsend Acts to ease tensions. Up, oh, hold on. All duties except one. Tea. 
Uh, the T Act is actually reinforced in 1773. But you have to keep in mind, like if you are, if you're in a social movement, you've already gotten a lot of what you want. All those prior duties that had pissed you off, you you kind of won. You got rid of them. The only you, you're now down to one on T. In 1772, a smuggler ship uh, named the Gatsby was burned, and the colonists see it as a conspiracy, as nothing comes from the investigation. So there was basically smuggled tea um, that was on, aboard this Gatsby uh, coming into Boston, and it, it's burned. And basically they think – the colonists think that this smuggled tea, which would have been in, in theory cheaper, better than the British tea, uh, they don't get to have it, and they think the British did it, and they're mad about it. And then the Tea Act comes along in 1773 and reinforces things, um, and it is an important duty to be paid. The Tea Act is meant to undercut other smuggled tea, mostly from the Dutch, but the colonists would argue it undercut their quote-unquote freedom and demanded all duties officers to resign. Their freedom to consume tea, I guess. I mean, whatever. Like I, Freedom! Like, when, when I think of freedom, it's not like what tea I can buy. It's like, because you're not British. Yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> But, I mean, it goes back to the argument, you know, is making a classroom. Like, we're taught we're so free here because you get to choose between an LG and an iPhone, and yet you're still a slave to your damn phone. Oh, but I'm free because I got to choose this one or this one. Yep. Sheeple. Hutchinson stands firm in Boston, though. The, the Governor Hutchinson, he's been making numerous appearances today. Three ships were forced to stay in the harbor with the tea on them until the duty was paid. And on December 16th of 1773, we all know the very famous story... A bunch of malcontents go on board and dump the tea. Let's hear from a primary source again. This time we're going to hear from George Hughes, who recalls his partaking in the uh, what would become famously known as the Boston Tea Party, although it was not called that right away. He says the rebels, as they were pleased the style, to the style of Bostonians, should not withdraw their opposition to the landing of the tea before a certain day, the 17th of December, 1773. They should on that day force it on shore under the cover of the cannon's mouth. At that meeting, uh, and they set up basically, I guess I'm going to paraphrase here some of this because it's, it's long, but basically they decide they're going to set up a meeting with the Governor Hutchinson to deal with this issue. In this case, we can also fault Governor Hutchinson because he does not show up at the meeting, which pisses them off, and so that's when they decide that they are going to go ahead with their plan to dump the tea in the harbor. They show up in about three hours from the time we went on board. We had thus broken and thrown overboard every tea chest to be found in the ship, while those in the other ships were disposing of the tea in the same way at the same time. We were surrounded by British armed ships, but no attempt was made to resist us. So nothing really strikes a chord until that last line. Usually we learn it as of the Boston Tea Party as some sort of like clandestine, super cool, secret mission, dressed up as indigenous peoples, whatever. But here, George Hughes tells us, it was basically in daylight, and the British were surrounding us and just watched us do it. That's not nearly as romantic. No, or exciting. Or yeah. exciting. And the fact that the boss, the British did not, like, just sink the ship. And, in fact, I, if, if you're an authoritarian, I mean, why wouldn't you? You should have just – I mean, you would have probably saved yourself a lot of trouble if you just <laughs> sank the ship with all those people on it. I'm just kidding. During the time we were throwing the tea overboard, there were several attempts made by some of the citizens of Boston and its vicinity to carry off small quantities of it for their family use. To effect that object, they would watch their opportunity to snatch up a handful from the dock, or the deck, excuse me, where it became plentifully scattered and put into their pockets. Pause. I mean, you know, those are the most juicy parts anyway. Let's talk about that for a second. So George Hughes realizes that during this protest that... Again, Americans, American sons of liberty and heroes and the architects of this country, these these great people in one of their protests, what do they do? They're opportunists and they steal some tea. Oh, we call it opportunists that steal some tea. But if this happens in a modern protest and CNN or Fox News or any of these joke news stations get a hold of it, they will call those people looters. Oh, man. But when these guys doing it, they're opportunists. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, they needed their tea, right? Yeah, they yeah. super needed their tea. Right? No one needs diapers or right. anything. Right. They but, are yeah. confiscating the property of others, and they're taking advantage of a political situation to enrich themselves, but they're opportunists. But if you happen to be a person of color that is protesting something, whatever it might be, does not matter, and this also happens, or it happens after a major disaster like Hurricane Katrina, you're a looter. The hypocrisy of this country knows no bounds. I hope we're starting to see 
the main goal of this entire series of this podcast of how the narrative of this country has been morphed so much to justify just blatant state violence to oppress the people. I mean, that's what we're getting at here, right? The Crown ends up responding to all of these events as, again, like I said, I've been saying we're closing out here for like 10 minutes, but we really are now. The Crown does respond with what are they call the coercive acts or the Americans call them the intolerable acts. Either way, uh, there's no way for me to uh, put lipstick on this, this pig here. Uh, the British are dumb. Dumb. This is oppressive. This is oppressive. Finally, they're at, they are being oppressive and, and, and they are. There's, I can't, I can't, can't argue against this. Which is kind of weird because they already gave them all of the taxes except for tea. If they probably just waited a while, it might have like burned itself out. Yeah, this was dumb. This was highly reactionary on England's part and there's no justifying this. The first act, there's five of them. Boston Port Act. Basically, they closed Boston Harbor. Well, anyone that knows anything about Boston at this time knows that the way to make a living was via the harbor, whether it was fishing or uh, mercantilism, whatever it was, like shipbuilding, like Boston, that's how you make a living. Closing the harbor cuts off people from their way of making a living, and that's going to piss everybody off. Dumb. Dumb British. Massachusetts Government Act. Basically, Parliament claims the charter over the government of uh, Massachusetts. So basically now that argument that they're not being represented, the British could always argue, well, A, you have virtual representation in the House of Commons, and B, you have your own local government. Well, they don't have that anymore, so now they actually are not being represented. Dumb British. Dumb. Second, impartial or third, excuse me, impartial administration of justice act. Long story short, if a British soldier does something bad or commits a crime in the colonies, they will actually now be taken back to England to face justice. And of course, this is going to upset colonists because they're going to basically feel like soldiers could get away with anything now and they'll never face justice, which means that they, they, they have more to fear. The Quartering Act. This one, of course, is important enough that it actually uh, makes its way into uh, becoming an amendment uh, about a decade later in the Constitution, maybe a little uh, more more like two decades, but whatever, um, in the Constitution. Long story short, uh, English soldiers can lodge themselves anywhere they see fit to include homes or businesses or whatever. Now, it didn't happen in homes nearly as much as like we like to say it did. Like they didn't, Because why would you want to live there if you're a British soldier just like show up and like live with people that hate you? Like that's not a thing. But it could have happened. Um, and it definitely happened in businesses and stuff like that. Okay. The last one, the Quebec Act. Uh, basically, what the Quebec Act did is it solidified both French and Catholic laws in Canada. And if you're wondering why that would piss off American colonists so much, well, in their own minds, they're losing rights. And people that aren't even British citizens, i.e. the French that got taken over in the French and Indian War, are getting more rights. So it was like the British giving them a giant, like, middle finger, like a giant fuck you, like here, like you're our own citizens, but you have to deal with all this. Meanwhile, these French citizens who are now, we're trying to make British citizens get to do whatever they want. So it was. The First Continental Congress is established in September of 1774 to basically deal with these things. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through it because it's super boring. Basically, uh, little uh, ideas are exchanged except that they, hey, they like these ideas of boycotts and non-consumption. So, but they're going to take credit for it now rather than the Daughters of Liberty. So they're going to keep doing those. Cool. Cool. Good job, guys. Anyway. Uh, accelerating things a little bit further, on April 18th of 1775, the British look to raid am munition stocks in Concord. And, uh, the idea here is that the Minutemen, uh, which I'm not gonna actually do anything on, there, we're already inundated with information on the Minutemen in our, uh, education systems, decide they are going to try and stop this from happening. And of course, this very famous ride by the son of liberty paul revere uh succeeds in warning the minutemen and the other patriots involved that the quote-unquote british are coming or the redcoats are coming or whatever you've heard here we have to actually call out this is pretty harmless myth but it is a myth it wasn't just revere there were numerous actors that rode some of the more famous would be uh dawes and prescott they also went on the ride and the irony is that revere didn't even succeed he's actually captured on this ride so he actually doesn't succeed the only reason we think of this uh this story or the story is taught to us is it actually comes from a poem written later by a dude named henry longfellow called paul revere's ride and the reason he even chose to make revere the focus of the story was a he's trying to tell a patriotic story before a war but b Paul Revere's name rhymed better with what he was putting together in the poem, and C, 
Paul Revere was the most famous or well-respected of the bunch based on the other things that he was able to do. So yeah, Paul Revere's ride, you've been lied to. Sorry. Uh, anyway, the standoff actually does occur in Lexington, and a shot is fired, the shot heard around the world, as some would say, leading to a military engagement. More shooting takes place as more British soldiers arrive in Concord, Concord, and eventually the British are forced to move back, and they're harassed all the way on their march back to Boston via, honestly, guerrilla warfare learned from indigenous people, ironically enough. But that kind of closes out this part of our, our discussion on the war for independence. We're going to dig into a little bit more of the uh, the building uh, up of the movement in 1775 and then, of course, the breakout of outright war. And then, in my opinion, and maybe Nick's too, arguably the most important pamphlet and man of this era, Thomas Paine and Common Sense. So that's what we're going to be talking about in the next episode. You got anything else for us before we close this one out? No, I think that pretty much does it. We'll pick up everything else uh, on the next one. So be sure to check us out at revolutionandideology.com. You can subscribe on a, uh, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast app. Check us out on YouTube. Our channel is Revolution and Ideology. Make sure you subscribe to us there. Uh, we'll pick this up next time. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.